Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning Bible class at the Cary Church of Christ. We're glad that you're able to be with us this morning and certainly pray if you're visiting with us that we want you to know how thankful we are, but that you and your family are safe as well as all of our family at Cary. Continue to pray for our congregation as a whole. Looking forward to that day when we can be back together for Bible class and all of our worship services, but we do understand because of the situation that's going on right now, but hopefully one day soon, but continue to lift each other up, continue to reach out to one another. Before we start, let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and glorious name. We thank thee for this day. We thank thee for the blessings uh, that you give us each and every day because you call us your children. We're thankful that you love us and you watch over us, and we're so thankful that you bless us. Father, we thank you for uh, this time now that we have to study your word. We thank you for everyone who is able to be with us online today. We thank you for the privilege and the opportunity that is ours. And we also thank you for the ability that we have to be able to do those things. Father, we pray as we study your word that you'll be with us, that we have open minds and open hearts as we uh, listen to what your word tells us and what you desire of us to be better today than we were yesterday. Father, help us to always grow in you. We pray for our church uh, here at Cary, Father, pray you'll continue to bless us, that you'll watch over us and walk with us as you always do. Father, we pray for our congregation as we're separated. We're thankful that we're able to worship uh, in some capacity right now, Father, but we do look forward to that day when we can be back together. We're thankful for those online who might be watching who are not part of our family at Cary, but we're so thankful for their presence. We pray that you bless them and their families and that you'll watch over them as well. Father, we pray for the country. Uh, we pray for uh, unity. We pray for understanding. We pray for love. But most of all, we pray that they'll turn their eyes and their minds and their hearts towards you and to your word. Father, help us to always be courageous, to reach out into our communities, to show people the love of Christ, and to show people what it means to be uh, part of your family. Father, we pray for our first responders, thankful for what they do for us, that you'll continue to bless them. Father, we also pray for those who might have been affected by uh, the hurricane down in the Gulf. Pray that you'll continue to watch over them and bless them. Father, we're also thankful for disaster relief and, and what they do and what they mean to so many people. Continue to bless them as well. Father, we pray that you lift up our elders, uh, continue to give them courage and strength. Be with us as a whole. Watch over us as you always do. Father, we know we fail you sometimes. We make mistakes, but we're so thankful that you forgive us as we repent of our sins. We ask all of this in your son's most precious and divine name. Amen. Well, last week, as we continued looking at our study of the Godhead, we began to look at um, how the Holy Spirit operates today, and more so how the Holy Spirit operates and influences man. And so there are several things that we talked about last week, specifically how the Holy Spirit then operates today through the Word of God. And we asked several different questions, but we want to continue that study today, and we want to delve in just a little bit deeper as we look at some specific examples in the Bible. But I want us to first look at a few charts, and I want us to kind of see the conversions and how the Holy Spirit operated even during the times of miracles when the Holy Spirit would indwell personally in individuals, specifically the apostles and disciples and those gifts that were given to some individuals. But I want us to see how the Holy Spirit operated even during the time of biblicals, of the biblical time to see the conversions that took place during the first century. And so one of the, the first things we're going to notice as we look at how the Holy Spirit influences men and how we see what the Holy Spirit did during these conversions it always started out with them hearing the Word of God. And we understand that the Word of God is active. Uh, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. We understand how powerful the Word of God is. And that doesn't change today. It doesn't mean that God's Word is some dead letter that means nothing to us. The Holy Spirit certainly is active through God's Word today. And so as we look at this chart, we want to notice how the Holy Spirit operates and how we can see that it's seen in cases of conversion. And so we're not going to be able to go through all of these verses because of time, but you have this on your screen. If you would like a copy of this, please send me an email at minister at and I'll be more than happy to send these to you. But certainly you can also pause your screen and write these things down as well. But I want us to see in these different conversions as we see the gospel is either being preached or spoke or given in some form, and the actions that are then taken and the results that happen help us to see that we can see how the Holy Spirit operates through God's Word then, and we also see how the Holy Spirit operates through God's Word today. The Word of God was presented in every single case 
that we see concerning these conversions. It's the same thing we then see and how that's applied today of how people come unto the gospel to learn about the gospel where we're called by the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2.14. And so it's very important for us to understand that. One of the, the things that I mentioned from the very onset of this class concerning the Holy Spirit was to throw out everything that you know or the, everything that you've ever heard about the Holy Spirit and then tell me what you know about the Holy Spirit. The only way we can do that is going back to God's Word to see what the Holy Spirit did then and then certainly how the Holy Spirit affects us today. And so we know what God's Word does for us and how it makes us complete into every good word, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So obviously we know as we look at Acts chapter 2, we see and know this being the day of Pentecost and we know the apostles stood up and that they had the gift of tongues, that is they were speaking so everyone who spoke in a different language could understand what they were saying in their tongue or in their language. This was not some sporadic utterance that made no sense whatsoever, but it's as if they were speaking and the individuals, depending on their nationalities, could understand in their native tongue what the apostles were saying. So the word was spoken, as we know in Acts chapter 2. The Bible tells us that they were pricked in their heart when they heard the word. The action was being pricked in their heart that they were then baptized and they were then added to the church and they were saved, Acts 2 and verse 47. And we see thousands of individuals being added to the Lord's church. When we look at Acts chapter 8, when we see the conversion accounts that take place here, we see that the word was preached, that they heard the word, they believed what they were hearing. There was not some separate indwelling. The Holy Spirit was then tapping them on the shoulder saying, hey, you need to believe this now. They believed from what they heard. They were baptized and we see the result was great joy or they went away rejoicing. In Acts chapter 10 and 11, we see the conversion of Cornelius and his house. As Peter went to preach unto them, he spoke the word. They heard the word. They believed they were baptized and they were saved. In Acts chapter 16, that they were, um, the word was spoken unto them. Their hearts were opened. They attended to what was being said. They were baptized and they were saved. Again, in the latter part of Acts 16, spoke, heard, believed, baptized, and their stripes were washed. Acts 18, verses 1 through 8, they reasoned with the individuals that said, they heard the word, they believed, they were baptized, and they were saved. And again, in Acts chapter 9, 22 and 26, we see the same things taking place, and the result was that their sins were washed away. So again, if this was the case during the time of the first century, during the time that the gospel was in its infancy, during the time when they did not have the complete revelation of God's Word, why did God not, as some claim today, the Holy Spirit then just directly indwell them, inferring to them, telling them what they needed to know, telling them what they should do, and then saving them at that particular point. Why is it that they had to go through all of these specific accounts that we read about in the book of Acts concerning these conversions, how they were spoken to or preached to, they heard, they responded, they were baptized, and they were saved by what they believed? Because the same thing we see in the first century is the same thing that then takes place today concerning God's Word and how the Holy Spirit operates. Well, let's look in the next chart. How the Holy Spirit operates is seen also in the cases of those who were not converted. So these are non-conversion accounts. And we can see how the word actually had the opposite effect. That is, they didn't want to believe what they heard or they were going to wait. And so we see that taking place here. So in Acts chapter 5, when they had when they were spoken to concerning the gospel and the things which they should have done, they heard it. It said they were cut to their heart. They basically gnashed with their teeth and they wanted to kill them because of what they had heard. They didn't want anything to do with it. These were the Jews reacting to the gospel. In Acts chapter 7, when we see um, this particular account that they were spoke, uh, spoken to, heard, they were cut to the heart, they resisted and they stoned Stephen to death because they didn't want to listen to what was being told of them. Acts chapter 13, 14 through 46 the word was spoken unto them. They heard it. In all of these instances, they were able to hear the word and reason whether or not they wanted to believe and to respond to it. So it said they contradicted and blasphemed the word and they rejected it. So those individuals, those proponents that say today that the Holy Spirit indwells and tells you then that you're going to be saved, this contradicts that particular theory because it says they, that they blaspheme and they rejected God's word. God gives everyone the ability to choose whether or not they want to serve Him. 
whether or not they want to believe. The Bible tells us for us to be saved, there are steps we take concerning God's plan for man. We hear the word, Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We believe that word, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16 and verse 16. And also not only must we hear and believe, we must also respond to tell people who Jesus Christ is, that we believe he is the son of God. And with our mouth confession is made unto or for our salvation, Romans 10, 17. And with that, then we're baptized, uh, or uh, then we repent, and then we're baptized to have our sins washed away, and the Lord adds us to the church. So we make that decision as to whether or not we want to accept the gospel in its whole as the truth of God's plan for us. In Acts chapter, 13, or Acts chapter 17, spoke, heard, they mocked the word, and they rejected it. They didn't want to believe in it. Acts 24, they reasoned with them concerning what the gospel did. They heard this, they trembled, but they, you know what, they put it off. As everyone has the opportunity to put off God's word. Acts 26, the word was spoken to them, they heard, believed, and they rejected. And then the same thing in Acts 28, they expounded or testified unto them God's commandments. They didn't believe it and they disputed those things that were said. So again, everyone has the opportunity as to whether or not they want to receive or to reject God's word. So the Holy Spirit should have and could have convinced the whole population of the Israelites, you know what, this is what you need to do. Why didn't he do that then? Why did God not choose this nation for whom Jesus Christ was going to come if God is all-powerful and all-knowing and he could just say, you know what, you're going to become Christians now. You're no longer Jews. Why didn't he do that? How does God then choose certain individuals that is their heart's right and mine's not? Does that not then do away with the whole preaching to the gospel that we talked about last week? What then is the purpose of taking the gospel to the world if God is a respecter of persons, of which Peter himself said God was not a respecter of persons in Acts chapter 11? How then can we say that God becomes a respecter of persons and only gives certain people the Holy Spirit? It doesn't make any sense, and that doctrine doesn't fly. So when we think about each case of the Holy Spirit gave the message which was presented by the preacher. The same thing that happens today. The Lord's command in Mark 16, 15 and 16 was being fulfilled when he said to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what we see taking place in both of these charts that we looked at. In each case, the word was heard, even, through a, even though a specific statement to that effect is not reported. But they heard the word, they believed, and they had a choice whether or not to reject it. And not everyone who heard that message, again, believed it. But they had a choice whether or not they were going to. Recall John 8 and verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but Jesus said, you seek to kill me because you don't believe my word. My word doesn't have any place in you. Again, they had a choice. They can choose whether or not they wanted to follow after Christ, but they didn't. John 8, 44 through 45, you are, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. Again, why didn't Jesus just put the Holy Spirit on them, as some people say, and give them the truth and make them believe in who Jesus Christ was? Because they had to come to Jesus based upon their own understanding of who he was. The same thing happens today. God wants people to come to him who understand, know, and believe who Jesus Christ is. And Jesus Christ is the one that has access to God. Remember, Jesus Christ says, no man can come up to me or no man can come to the Father except by me who, is, who the Father has sent. And so Jesus is telling us that if we want access to the Father, we've got to believe that he's the Son of God and that he was sin of God. So belief is stated or implied in each case of conversion that we read about in the New Testament. Without faith in God, there is no spiritual blessings in God, Hebrews eleven six, 6. And so there has to be this belief system You'll hear some people say that they were just walking down the street. I heard one particular man say as he was giving his witness account, as he was walking down the street and he felt like the Holy Spirit just smacked him in the back of the head and said, hey, you, you need to be saved. He said he had never read the Bible or heard the Word of God before, but the Holy Spirit just smacked him and knocked him off the sidewalk, and all of a sudden now he's a, a believer of, of Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's not how God works. God does in no way work that way today, and the Bible tells us that he doesn't work that way today. Remember John 8 and verse 24. 
Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, Jesus said, you're going to die in your sins. You have to believe that I am the Son of God. Not the Holy Spirit telling you what you must believe. You have to believe that I'm the Son of God. And so what we have to remember, as Paul talks about in Romans 1, 16 and 17, how powerful God's Word is. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Their belief, their trust in God, not what the Holy Spirit is telling them to do separate and apart from the Word, they're doing this because of their faith in the Word. We also see that repentance is stated, and it's implied in each case of conversions. Acts 17, 30, For these, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So all men are required to acknowledge their sins, as we see in the conversion accounts, that they were living in sin or that they were living wrong. Confession of faith is also presented in each case. It's stated by fact or by implication. Jesus said, Therefore, whoever shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. Acts 8, 37. Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Why didn't the Holy Spirit indwell in him and tell him what he needed to believe? Because he had to do it for himself. Because God wants individuals in His family that want to be there. God doesn't force us to be there or trick us into becoming part of His family. Romans 10 and verse 10, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then we see that baptism is specifically mentioned in the conversion account. So, if the direct operation of the Holy Spirit theory is so, then there are some awful consequences. Again, go to all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to those who believe. And so the importance of this is, is that we understand people are hearing the message of God. Again, going back to the previous statement, if the direct operation of the spirit theory is so, there are some awful consequences that we have to consider. And some of these we addressed um, in a few instances last week, but when you think about these things, it helps us to better understand that there are some holes in the direct operation of the Holy Spirit theory. The theory would eliminate the mediatorship of Christ. 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It would remove the need for the gospel and would thus mean that Christ died in vain. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? John 1 and verse 1. It would erase the purpose and the mission of the apostles to go out into all the world that Jesus, in giving them the Great Commission, to preach the gospel to every creature because they don't need it. They've got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will just do all the work for them. It would also eliminate the work of evangelists then and now. What would be the purpose then for us coming to church that the Holy Spirit is going to tell you everything you need to do? He's going to make you believe, He's going to make you obey, and He's going to make you to be saved. So pray tell, then why do we have so many churches today? It also denies the need for obedience to the gospel. I don't need to do anything. The Holy Spirit's going to do everything for me. So again, we see the many holes that we can punch in this direct operation theory or this concept that man is a proponent of today because it sounds good. Because we can make things up and we can say things. The Holy Spirit told me to do this. That's not what the Word says. But I'm telling you the Holy Spirit was direct in telling me this I needed to do. Well, I think that's probably not, not true. Because God gives us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Those things that make us complete. The things that we need. But now you're saying the Holy Spirit is going against what God's Word said. Even though He's part of the three member Godhead. That doesn't make any sense either. And so when we go back and we see these specific instances here, it would deny the need for ever needing the gospel, and Jesus died for nothing. He died that we might be saved through His Word because He was the Word. It denies the obedience for the gospel. Think about Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, he who is obedient to the message... 
Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not purchased or prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness or iniquity. We also see in Luke 16, or Luke 6 and verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? Well, I don't have to do what the Word of God says. I'm just going to wait for the Holy Spirit to smack me in the back of the head and knock me off the sidewalk and tell me what I need to do. That's not how it operates. John 14 and verse 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So Jesus said, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. If you do what I tell you, as Jesus said in John 14 and verse 15, you are my friends. If you do whatsoever I command you, we understand the concept then of what obedience is. Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9. Though he were a son, this is referring to Jesus, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Those that are obedient in following his commandments. Not that the Holy Spirit was going to tell them separate and apart from the word. It would make God, again, a respecter of persons. Hebrews, or excuse me, Acts chapter 10, 34 and 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality and is not a respecter, as the King James Version says, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness, that is, does what God commands them to do, is accepted by him. So Peter says, In truth, I believe that God doesn't show partiality. God doesn't say, You get the Holy Spirit. Sorry, you're just out of luck today. No Holy Spirit for you. What kind of God would that be? If God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son to die for mankind, what kind of God would that be to show mercy to this person but leave me out because I just wasn't one of the chosen ones as some of those dogmas or doctrines say today? Peter says that's not who God is. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want to lose anyone. And if that's the case, why not have everyone have a direct operation of the Holy Spirit? Peter said he's not a, not a respecter of persons, but God also says we have to choose whom we're going to serve, just as Joshua did in Joshua 24 in verse 15. And so it contradicts what Jesus Christ says in Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23. Anyone who does the will of my Father, those who go against me, Jesus says, I basically want no part, no part of you. Depart from me, ye who work lawlessness. And it removes all of personal responsibility for man and places all of that responsibility entirely on God. I'm just going to wait for the Holy Spirit to show up. I mean, couldn't I get away with that based upon doctrine today? But when he doesn't show up, it's not my fault. God, I'm here waiting on you. Where's the Holy Spirit? I mean, you want me to be saved. The Bible tells me you want all of mankind to be saved. So why am I not yet saved? Why haven't I I heard your voice or felt your presence or you pushed me off the sidewalk? Why haven't you saved me, God? God says, well, I've told you what you need to do to be saved. But the ball's in your court. And so it's not me waiting on God. God has done his part. Now it's my responsibility to do my part. So the theory in short is, is, is... The theory is a shortcut, rather, and it's a cheap man-made substitution for God's will. And it's an excuse not to go through and do what God tells us to do. Because now we say, God, this is on you, not on me. You want me? Come and get me. (laughs) That's not the way the world works today, and that's certainly not how God operates. It puts the burden and responsibility on God entirely, and that's not how He operates. The Holy Spirit convicts and converts alien sinners only through the Word, and He does so only when the Word is faithfully preached, believed, and obeyed. Look at Acts chapter 18 and verse 8. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his household, and many of of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Why not just send the Holy Spirit? Look at the next verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed... You were cleansed, your sins were washed away, but you were sanctified, you were set apart, you were pulled out of the world because you were obedient to the gospel, but you were justified just if you had never sinned in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. But you were washed, you were sanctified, 
If you read verses 9 and 10, Paul talks about what they were. Adulterers, idolaters, fornicators, revilers, gossipers. All of these things they used to be. He said, you used to be those people, but you're not that people anymore. Because you were washed, you were sanctified, you were obedient. You chose this life. You wanted to follow after God. 1 Peter 4.11 If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. And if anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all these things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So if you're going to speak, speak as the oracles, the word in which God gives you. And if you want ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies. Look at 2 Corinthians 2.17. For we are not, as so many, peddling the word of God. There are many out there claiming to be ministers of God, but they're peddling the word. But as of sincerity, but as of from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. There are many out there claiming... <laughs> Just as they are today, claiming to have the Word of God, but speak nothing but lies, Paul says that's not the case. We're telling you the truth, because what we have is the truth, and it's going to save you. Galatians 2, 4, and 5. And this occurred because of the false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by the stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. They want to bring us into their false doctrine. But Paul said, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Paul said, don't listen to that false doctrine out there because it's not going to save you. Look at the next verse, 2 Peter 3.16. As also in all his epistles or letters, speaking in them of these things in which we are some things hard to understand, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the Scriptures. The Word of God they have, they were twisting it into something they thought they wanted it to be. Kind of sounds like a lot of false denominations or false doctrines and denominations out there today, doesn't it? And so Paul is saying here that this occurred because false brethren secretly were coming in and teaching these things. And Peter then says, speaking the things to thee, and they were twisting God's Word because they were untaught and unstable because they were doing it to their own destruction. False doctrine. And so when we think about this, our part is simple. Obedience is absolutely required to what God tells us to do. God gives us the instruction manual clear and present before us that we can follow it, know it, and it tells us what we need to do. Next week, we're going to continue looking at the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to see how active it is, even today through His Word and what we must do to continue to follow after that. Again, if there are um, any questions you have concerning the class, please reach out to me and email me at minister at carycoc.org, or you can find our information on our website at carycoc.org. If you would like the slides or the charts that I listed in the beginning of the class, please feel free to reach out. I'll be happy to send that to you so that you have that for your studies as well. I hope this has helped you. Again, if you have questions, let me know. Looking forward to us worshiping together in just a few moments. Take care, and God bless you.